what's happening, technically speaking? I've got my man Jay on the call, and where are you at? You were in Australia, right? Yeah, I'm in Australia right now, which is pretty wild. I'm in Melbourne, to be specific. Ah, nice, nice. I feel like it's it's always like, where is Jay? Because you've been to like the Bay Area twice since the last time that I've seen you, and our schedules haven't exactly lined up uh, in in the best way possible, but. I must say for the fact that you live like halfway across the world, it's just amazing just how close in contact we are. Always great to to see and hear from you. And bro, you've been on a you've been on a world tour. What's happening? What's going on? <laughs> yeah, I got really lucky this year. I didn't expect to be on doing all these talks and they were just agreements from like previous co conversations from last year. Yeah. Yeah. I was in Vancouver and then I guess I did an amazing job. Then I went to Toronto, same conference, peep organizers in general. Then I went to the Philippines. Yeah. And then, yeah, I did, did one in Tokyo. Oh, well. that's amazing. Maybe give listeners a little bit of background in terms of what has your talk track been? Because I was, I actually just had a recording with Fonz Morris. I know you all met in the Philippines and he's doing his thing too, like in terms of traveling and talking and yeah what, what's top of mind for you when you're in these spaces oh my gosh it first started off with talking about inclusion and dei which is getting crap on right now for yeah really poor reasons and i think for me it's just really important to just the first the, the the first talk in the beginning of the year was more about how do you design and be inclusive for your users yeah but now it's changed into designing for or bringing value to the bring value to design through the business and understanding your stakeholders. So it's very like high level and something that you probably sure. have to deal with of convincing people of like why it's valuable to hire a designer or even why this has to be nicely designed for our users in general, but also being inclusive to our stakeholders and using the same language. And people don't realize how important that is. And I know some people, especially in Southeast Asia, are a little bit confused by the concept, but I know well, it's obviously been hitting a lot of the right buttons with some people. So that's probably the most important part. Yeah, that's dope. Hopefully listeners can have an opportunity to, to check out some of those talks. Are any of them publicly available? The one in the Philippines is not yet, but I think that's yeah. the one that everyone should probably check out because I made people cry again. Oh, my man. Wow. So it's, it's like an emotional type of thing. Oh yeah, Fonz called me, and I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm allowed to say this, but he called me the the Malcolm X of Filipinos, which is hilarious. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> go go look for it. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, folks have to listen to it themselves and make the judgment there, but we'll take the anecdote. We'll we'll take it. We'll take it. Look, let's get into it. I'm super excited about our episode today because it's a little bit different format than listeners are used to. Normally we go through the Q&A, but it'll be a discussion. And I, we're both obviously design practitioners. We've been in the industry for quite some time. We've seen it from multiple different angles, but we're going to be talking about the rise and fall, if you will, of InVision. And for listeners that aren't familiar and just to even just set a level set with folks is Envision at one point was really a, a disruptive design tool on the market, right? Like a lot of folks today, we talk about Envision, or excuse me, we talk about Figma. Some folks talk about XD, but I don't really think that's the case. Some folks have also, they might still work with Sketch. And so Envision at one point, we thought was going to run away with it. And so We'll get into the reasons why, and maybe we can start and, and create like the timeline here. Envision was started in 2011. And if we think about like the timeline, like Figma was actually started a year later, but Figma didn't really catch on because their whole premise was multiplayer yeah. and it was browser based. And so right. that really wasn't a need for the market at that point in time. Most studios because there were a lot of studios back then, and then teams started moving in-house, but most folks are working out of Photoshop at that point, right? What was your kind of stack back then? Oh my gosh. 
Photoshop, remember Dreamweaver when that was oh, around? Yeah. That was still yeah. like being used, dude. Like yeah. it was crazy. What else? Like I sometimes I would use Illustrator because I'd have to have to create like a lot of pixel stuff as yeah. well, like on top of like iconography yeah. and whatnot. But there wasn't really like a good program no. in general for UX. Yeah. And on top of that, I always remember this was like when I was transitioning in the product design use UX, right? And Photoshop was like the de facto because it could do it, right? You would do the, you would, you might use Illustrator, but the pixel was always off, right? It was always like a half yeah. a pixel off. And this was like at a time too, when, you know, I think like Android had, they were doing like pixel density, right? Yeah. Um, and then we were just getting into responsive stuff. So there was nothing like really focused on product design. And so it? that like, it was crazy. Like you're talking about Dreamweaver. I still remember like my first role, I was coding for prototypes. So it was like, you launch like these like kernels or whatever, you mean you're like in, you're literally in, in terminal and you're launching like these JavaScript programs to create a simulation or an environment. And then I was literally like, fortunately I like, I knew how to code. But I found myself like at that point, so frustrated, dude. Cause I was like, I was literally building prototypes and bug bashing half the time. Yeah. That, that was Crazy. rough, man. Yeah. Because, and also remember like when flash was a thing and no. before Apple took away all the flash script from everything, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of things were built on there on, on web specifically, but it looked like crap on mobile because no one really considered mobile back in the day. Right. No. And until Apple made the iPhone. Yeah. So the iPhone was a huge like game changer. And it, and again, I think like I was designing for iPhone. I was designing for Android and Windows Phone. That's right. So that was crazy. Mm. Design systems weren't really the thing at that point. I think I think Twitter. So obviously people now act associated yeah. with X. Twitter was actually leading industry wise in terms of like design systems, because they had their Twitter design language that you could look at, you could see the documentation. And so this predates, it doesn't predate obviously like Apple human design guidelines, but human design guidelines before almost was like, like a manifesto. So you could interpret right. it in so many different ways. Um, and this was also pre material design. And so a lot of people were looking <laughs> at like Twitter for design system inspiration, which is super crazy to think about that now. And it's weird because if you think about it, Twitter did start like design Twitter literally started back then because everyone yeah. was documenting what they were using. And yeah. that's how I found out about like certain programs like Envision and, and whatnot or Figma or whatever, because it was like all over Twitter. I was like, what is this thing? Yeah. And if you remember, Twitter was like, like the place to go, like the, the, nerdy, the nerdy kids would go to find yeah. things in general. The hashtags. That's right. The back panel. That's right. So one, one of the things that disrupted the whole Photoshop and Illustrator workflow was Sketch. And I know you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but Sketch basically ended up becoming like the de facto product design tool because it wasn't a situation when you opened up where you had this open canvas and you had to put in the dimensions. It actually already had those things in, in place, right? So you would choose like your iPhone, what was it iPhone four versus yeah. an iPhone five oh, versus this is the like, first time we saw that too. We were yeah. minds of bloom, right? What? I know. So that, that, in my opinion, really started to, it brought a new layer of just like efficiency because also you weren't saving these huge Photoshop files. No. They're huge ass sketch files. <laughs> they're huge, they're huge sketch files. Correct. Exactly. But do you remember, I know we went through this for a little bit with sketch, but like when you were designing with Photoshop, remember you would save like the date that you would save the file oh, and you put that file so in that bad. date. Yeah. And everyone had a different, like you go from one org to another, every company had a totally different file structure. Oh dude. Yeah. Like Apple had their own design structure, but it's funny because if you worked with ex Apple people, they'd yeah. have the similar file structure in their Photoshop or even like sketch. If they use sketch, it was like wild. They would yeah. name their layers. 
they have dates and i was like crazy i was like what there's like a whole function yeah. to this i didn't realize there was like a whole different level to it yeah that that reminds me that's like when the layer conversation started to really that's right take off right because yeah. sketch i think you had the different kind of actually no you had basically the storyboard same thing like with figma and sketch had a very illustrator like it, it took from Adobe Illustrator, right? If you think about the format yeah. and, but then on the left side, you had all of the layers, which is similar now in, in Figma. I think, I think it's standard for a lot of programs now, but yeah, mm -hmm. when you start working with larger teams, which was the case, people would get really anal about their layers. Oh, dude, they, <laughs> yeah, I remember everybody would make memes and it's still a meme to this day about naming layers, especially on Figma. And it's fascinating because the layers weren't, they're important, but I guess when you think about it, the question was, how do we get these to the engineers? Like, <laughs> exactly. It was like the biggest thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that was, so when you talk about red lines, so that's like where the origination of red, I don't think red that's lines right. are the exact same anymore, but you no. would literally have to create another file and then basically call out like the pixels yeah. it's really interesting because like i feel like that was very tedious work and i know designers yeah. just, just don't really have to think about those as much but i actually thought that was a very how would you how would you say that what's the word for it discipline it created a discipline it's yeah. like one of those things where you look at, like for me like i can look at something and be like yo that's 16 pixels no nah, that's off that's right that's right, right. And I think it's important to establish all of these things, like bringing back all these memories, um, because I think the engineering piece was really difficult. And like, for me, like personally, the company I was working at, we had engineers in Poland. My and gosh. so I was always up against the clock to get things to them because if I didn't, that was like two days of work that was, that were lost. That's right. And I Dude. didn't really... I didn't even know these guys like that, right? Because I hadn't even flown out there. I don't know. They may not even speak warriors. English. Like, how do they yeah. understand, like, your um, thinking on the layouts? Is it, like, pixels? Like, can they look at that? Do you have to make something for them that understand that? It was so hard back then. Yeah. And whatever you deliver, it had to be on point, right? There was no margin for error. Yeah, it was a little bit, um, what do you call it? What's the word? It was very... It was just very difficult and there was no room for error because yeah. whatever you delivered is was going to be built and it was on you <laughs> if you messed up, right? I know. I know. I feel like you skipped over the word margin for error. I was like, man, is it Dude. really that kind of trauma <laughs> right? that you, you just Dude, I was so traumatized because <laughs> I remember marking out like a giant sketch seat. And yeah. like having all the padding and the red lines. And then I would realize, oh, they need like different file, like different screen sizes for like older Android devices. And I don't have yeah. that on my spec sheet. And I'm, and I was freaking out. Yeah. The Android thing was so difficult, dude. Cause you were doing it for each and individual device. Right. And they okay. kept rolling out with so device. bad. Yeah. It was so annoying. Um, it was a thank lot. God for Zeppelin. Thank God yeah. for Zeppelin, though, when that came around, yeah. right? 